my lawn. So in this lesson, we are going to have a look at test one um, in Cambridge book eight. Now remember, test one, two, three, and four are for academic students only, right? General students, please watch the relevant video. It would have been renamed with the relevant book as well as the test, right? So this one is exclusively for academic IELTS candidates and we are having a look at test one, book eight, right? Now I'd like you to download the book and then start off with test one. Remember you have one hour to answer all 40 questions. So please on the timer now and do the, do, do the test one, right? And after you finished, then from there onwards, let's have a look at the answers. All right, so I hope you would have finished it by now. Let's have a look at the answers. Test one. Right, and reading passage one or section one. So whatever is inside the brackets, they are not compulsory, they are optional. If you have it, it's okay. If you don't have it, it's not a problem. But the words which are outside the bracket is definitely compulsory, okay? Like pendulum, compulsory word. Anchor, compulsory, right? So you can say ship's anchor, or you can say an anchor, or the anchor, right? You can say escape wheel, but if you don't have escape, that's fine, but you need to have wheel. You can't have only escape, then the answer is wrong. Right, reading passage two answers. And then finally, reading passage three answers. Right, so, oh, let me just give me a minute. I think we have to write down the answers here for you, right? 34 and 35, um, the two answers. So it can be in either order, right? You could have this in whichever way, um, that's completely fine, right? So it should be sensory leakage. and fraud. Okay, so you could have fraud and sensory leakage or sensory leakage and fraud, that's fine, okay? Right, so make sure that you've given your score out of 40 and check how much that is equivalent to what's your band score. So if you've got 0 to 12, okay, 13 to 20, 0 to 12, not okay, 13 to 29, okay, 30 above, definitely you're good, right? Okay, passage one, a chronicle of timekeeping, okay? So questions one to five, reading passage has eight paragraphs A to H and you need to match it, right? Um, a description of an early timekeeping invention affected by cold temperatures. So early timekeeping, cold temperatures. Now, if you go into paragraph D, the writer indicates that in order to track temporal hours during the day, inventors created sundials which indicate time by the length or direction of the sun's shadow. The sundial's counterpart, the water clock, was designed to measure the temporal hours at night. One of the first water clocks was a basin, right? So all those, these devices perform satisfactorily around the Mediterranean. They could not always be dependent on in the cloudy, freezing weather of Northern Europe, right? So what it means is that in certain parts, right, it was okay, but in certain parts, it wasn't that okay to rely on. So the answer is D. Moving on to question number two. 
an explanation of the importance of geography in the development of the calendar in farming communities. So what are our keywords? Geography, calendar, farming communities. Now if you go to paragraph B, the writer states that before the invention of artificial light, the moon had greater social impact. And for those living near the equator in particular, its waxing and waning was more conspicuous than the passing of the seasons. Right? Hence, the calendars that were developed at the lower latitudes were influenced more by the lunar cycle than by the solar year. Right? So the most appropriate answer I would say is B. So next one, um, a description of the origins of the pendulum clock. So this is in paragraph F where the writer says, by the 16th century a pendulum clock had been devised but the pendulum swung in large and are thus not very efficient. So that's definitely in paragraph F. Okay. Right. Details of the simultaneous efforts of different societies to calculate time using uniform hours. So that's definitely in para E. Calculate time uniform hours. So let's have a look at para E. What does the writer tell you? In the early 14th century, a number of systems evolved. The schemes divided day into 24 equal parts varied according to the start of the count. Italian hours began at the sunset, Babylonian hours at sunrise, astronomical hours at midday and great clock hours used for some large public clocks in Germany. So different societies calculated different times. Eventually, these were suspended by small clock or French hours which split the day into 12 hour periods commencing at midnight. So these efforts all occurred at around the same time. So you can see different countries were having different timelines. So I would say definitely para E. Questions 5 to 8. Look at the following events and list of nationalities be below, right? So um, they devise, you can have a look at the nationalities below in your uh, paper. As I always tell you, open up the paper on one side, minimize uh, my video on the other side of the screen, simultaneously go through those together. They devised a civil calendar in which the months were equal in length, right? So you have a civil calendar, you have months equal in length. Those are your key words. Now if you go to para C, the writer explains that centuries before the Roman Empire, the Egyptians had formulated a municipal calendar having 12 months of 30 days, with five days added to approximate the solar year, right? Therefore, the Egyptians devised this calendar. So the most appropriate answer I would say here is B. Right? So hopefully you are looking at the paper while you're doing this. If not, you will be a little lost. So make sure that you have the paper in front of you. Or you can print it out and take a hard copy and then look at it while I'm discussing. But don't just look at this and wait because it makes no sense if you're just looking at it, okay? So don't watch the video unless you've done it as well. It makes no sense. So make sure you do it and you watch it. If not, it will not really help you in any way, right? They divide the day into two equal halves. So divide two equal halves. If you go to paragraph E, the writer says, Eventually, these were suspended by small clock or French hours, which split the um, day into two 12-hour periods commencing at midnight. So here you will see that the answer is F. 
They developed a new cabinet shape for a type of timekeeper. New cabinet shape timekeeper. So let's have a look at paragraph G. The right says that in England in 1670, the invention of the anchor enabled the pendulum to travel in a very small arc, right? which means that it moved only a short distance. Okay, tick tock, tick tock, it's only small, it doesn't go tick tock, tick tock like that. Okay, so it just goes tick tick tick, right? Or it goes tick 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 tick, right? So a long pendulum which beat once every second could be used and thus led to the development of a new floor standing case design which became known as the grandfather's clock, which was a huge clock, right? Um, that stands alone, it goes tick tock, tick tock, right? Okay, so the pendulum goes both sides in an arc, right? So this grandfather clock, a type of timekeeper, stood on the floor and the pendulum moved inside the tall case, shaped lack. A cabinet okay so this shaped like a cabinet I would say but it looks like a cabinet so answer would be D okay question number eight they created a calendar to organize public events and work schedules so we've got keywords calendar organize public events work schedules so if you go to the first para, the writer says, the Babylonians began to measure time introducing calendars to coordinate communal activities, to plan the shipment of goods, and in particular, to regulate planting and harvesting. So the answer should be A. Questions number 9 to 13, label the diagram below. Right. So how the uh, 1670 uh, lever-based device worked, so your keywords are 1670 lever-based device, thus all the answers will be found in para G, right? So um, escapement, in para G the writer says, it was called the anchor escapement, which was a lever-based device, so you know it's called anchor there. Then um, the, the 10 and 11, writer explains the motion of the pendulum rocks this device so that it catches and releases each tooth of the escape wheel, right? So the wheel and the tooth. Okay. You can find the answer in para G. Next one, 12 and 13, right? Blank which beats each 13 blank, right? So if you go to G, the writer says, Moreover, this invention allowed the use of a long pendulum which could beat once a second. Uh -huh. So pendulum which beats each second, once a second, each second. So you've got pendulum, second. If you want, you can say long pendulum. Passage to air traffic control in the USA. Questions number 14 to 19, right? And it has seven paras, so you need to kind of match the headings with it, right? So paragraph A. In this para, right, the writer indicates an accident that occurred in the skies over the Grand Canyon in 1956 resulted in the establishment of the Federal Aviation Administration, FAAA, FAA, right? To regulate and oversee the operation of aircraft in the skies over the United States. So this paragraph's main idea is, um, you know, aviation disaster prompts action, right? So I would say it is number two. Right? Question number 15, right? In this paragraph, the writer argues that 
It was only after the creation of the FAA that full-scale regulation of America's airspace took place. And um, this was fortuitous for the advent of the jet engine suddenly resulted in a large number of very fast planes. So this paragraph is about two coincident developments, therefore the answer is three. Fortuitous is coincidental. Okay, so the meaning is here. Question number 16, paragraph D. In this paragraph, the writer argues that many people think that ATC consists of a row of controllers sitting in front of their radar screens at the nation's airport, telling arriving and departing traffic what to do. This is um, a very incomplete part of the picture. So this paragraph is about the view of AT, uh, ATC, right, which is oversimplified. So I would say answer is five. Question number 17, paragraph E. So in this paragraph, the writer writes about airspace, especially attitude zones and says, in general, from 350 meters above the ground and higher, the entire country is blanketed by controlled airspace. In certain areas, mainly near airports, controlled airspace extends down to 250 meters above the ground. Right, and it goes on. In this way, the recreational pilot who simply wishes to go flying for a while without all the restrictions composed by the FAA has only to stay in uncontrolled airspace below 365 meters, right? So the correct heading, I would say, is setting attitude zones would be number four. All right. Okay, question number 18, which is paragraph F. So in this paragraph, the writer writes about weather condition rules for the safety, right? And um, I would say in this paragraph, it is about setting the rules to weather conditions. So the answer would be eight, right? Paragraph G, which is question number 19. The main idea of this paragraph lies in the first sentence. Controlled airspace is divided into several types designated by letters of the alphabet. So this is about categories, right? There are four airspace categories. I would take it as seven. Question number 20 to 26. Do the following statements agree with the given information? I'm just going to count the S here, right? Agree with the given information of the reading passage. The FAA was created as a result of the introduction of the jet engine. So is it true or false, right? Do you agree with it? Yes or no, right? So FAA created jet engine are the key words. If you go to paragraph C, the writer argues that it was only after the creation of the FAA that full-scale regulation of America's airspace took place and this was fortuitous for the advent of the jet engine suddenly resulted in large number of very fast planes, right? So this means that the jet engine was created after the formation of the FAA. So FAA was created as a result, no, it was created after, so we could say false, okay? Um, next one, air traffic control started after the Grand Canyon crash. So after Grand Canyon crash, 1956. In the second para, the writer states that rudimentary air traffic control, ATC, existed well before the Grand Canyon disaster. So it wasn't started after, it was there well before that. So the answer is false. 22, beacons and flashing lights 
are still used by ATC today, right? So yes, in the passage, it does not mention whether the beacons and the flashing lights are still used by ATC today. So I would say we're not sure about it, so not given. Question number 23. Some improvements were made in radio communication during World War II, right? So improvements, radio communication, World War II are the key words. Now, if you go to para C, right, the writer says that in 1940 or in the 1940s, ATC centers, right, could and did take the advantage of newly developed radar and improved radio communication brought by the Second World War. So there was some improvement in radio communication during the World War II, about by the World War II means around that time. So I would take that as true. Right? Class F airspace is airspace which is below 350 meters and not near airports. So class F Below 365M, not near airports. Let's see. In the last para, the writer says, uncontrolled airspace is designated class F. In para E, it says, elsewhere is uncontrolled airspace. Pilots are bound by fewer regulations. In this way, the recreational pilot who simply wishes to go flying is kind of restricted below 650, six, sorry, 365 M, okay? So class F airspace is, which is below 365 M, yes, and not near airports, yes. So the answer is true. Because it says uncontrolled airspace, which is designated as class F, okay? Right. 25. All aircraft in class E airspace must use IFR. So all is a key word there. Class E must use IFR. So if you go to the last para, the writer says, the difference between class E and A is that airspace in class A, all operations are IFR. So no. Not class C, class A. So definitely um, it's false because class A, it's a must, but class E, um, this does not mean that class E aircrafts should use IFR, right? Okay, a pilot entering class C airspace is flying over an averaged, average sized city. So class C, an average size city. Now, if you go to the last para, the writer states that three other types of airspace classes, D, C, and B, govern the vicinity of airports. These correspond roughly to small municipal medium size metropolitan and major metropolitan airports respectively. Okay, so pile entering class C, airspace is flying over an average sized city. Yes, medium sized could be average sized. So yes, metropolitan is city. Okay, so answer is true. Now, if you don't know what metropolitan is, could be a problem, but you could guess that it probably means city. Okay, so finally, we are coming into para 3, telepathy. Complete each sentence with the ending A to G, right? So let's have a look at it. Researchers with differing attitudes towards telepathy agree on. What do they agree on, right? Differing attitudes, telepathy, agree. So if you go to para 2, the writer states, some researchers say the results constitute compelling evidence that telepathy is genuine. 
Other parapsychologists believe the field is on the brink of collapse. Having tried to produce definitive scientific proof had failed. Skeptics and advocates alike do concur on one issue, however, that the most impressive evidence so far has come from the so-called Gansfeld experiments, a German term that means whole field, right? So if we have a look at the answer, it's E because the significance of Gansfeld experiments. So you can see here, agree on what? So far, impressive evidence is on the Gansfeld experiments. So that is the answer. 28. Reports of experiences during meditation indicated, right? So reports, meditation indicated. In paragraph 2, the writer argues that reports of telepathic experiences had by people during meditation led parapsychologists to suspect that telepathy might involve signals passing between people who were so faint that they were usually swamped by normal brain activity. In this case, such signals might be more easily detected by those experiencing meditation like tranquility in a relaxing whole field of light, sound and warmth. So this means that when you have a suitable relaxing environment, right, um, and which should be created so that signals could be easily detected. So you need to create a suitable environment, the answer would be B, right? So reports of experiences during meditation indicated that the need, uh, indicated the need to create a suitable environment which was what um, having light sound and warmth a comfortable environment should be there question number 29 attitudes to parapsychology would alter drastically with what okay so attitudes alter with what in paragraph 7, the writer says that what they are certainly not finding, however, is any change in attitude. Mainstream scientists most today reject the very idea of telepathy. The problem stems at least in the part from the lack of any plausible mechanism for telepathy. So this means if there is a plausible tele, you know, mechanism for telepathy, um, attitudes for parapsychology would obviously change, alter drastically. So I would say answer is A. Alter means to change, right? Looking at question number 30. So we're nearly coming to the end. We've got about 10 questions more, right? So question number 30, recent Otto Gansfeld trials suggest that success rates will improve with what, right? So if you go to the last para, the writer indicates that some work has begun already with researchers trying to identify people who are particularly successful in Otto Gansfeld trials. Early results show that creative and artistic people do much better than the average. In one study at the University of Edinburgh, musicians achieved a high rate of 56%. It's not Edinburgh, it's Edinburgh. Okay. Um, this means that success rates will improve with more careful selection of subjects. So I would say the answer is... Thirty-one to forty. So thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. Involved a person acting as A who picked uh, who picked out one blank from a random selection of four and a blank who then tried to identify it. So keywords are Gansfeld studies in nineteen eighty-two. Okay, if we go to para. 3. 
The writer explains that in early Gansfeld experiments, the telepathy test involved identification of a picture chosen from a random selection of four taken uh, from a large image bank. The idea was that the person acting as a sender, so 31 answer is sender, would attempt to beam the image, okay, um, who picked out the image, right, um, from a random selection of four and uh, who then tried to identify it. So who identified the receiver relaxing in the sealed room. So who tried to identify the receiver? So sender, picture, receiver, those are your answers. Next one, question 34-35. Positive results could be produced by factors such as, what are the two? So if you go to question number four, right? The writer says that there were many other ways of getting positive results from sensory leakage to outright fraud. So outright, of course, can be optional. Fraud is a main word there, okay? So your two key words are sensory leakage and fraud. If you write outright fraud, that is also correct, right? So outright should be inside brackets. It's not compulsory, it could be an optional answer. But fraud definitely needs to be there. 36 and 37. Blank were used for key tasks to limit the amount of something in carrying out the test. Okay. So if you go to para 5, the writer says, after this many researchers switched to Otto Gansfeld tests, an automated variant of technique which, was which used computers. So what did they use? Computers were used. 36 computers. Uh, to perform the key tasks such as random selection of images. By minimizing human involvement, the idea was to minimize risk of flawed results. So to limit the amount of human involvement in carrying out the test. So computers for 36, human involvement for 37. So you can see if you find the proper place for the answer, Getting the answers is really easy. So how do you find it? By skimming and scanning your keywords. That's all. It's not that difficult. But what do you need? Practice, practice, practice. Once you start doing it, skimming, scanning, skimming, scanning, that automatically comes to you, right? 38. The results were then subjected to a what? So if you go to para 5, they say, in 1987, results from hundreds of Otto Gansfeld tests were studied by Honerton in the meta-analysis. So it was subject to what a meta-analysis, a statistical technique for finding the overall results from a set of studies. Okay. Question number 39 and 40. Blank between different test results was put down to the fact that the sample groups were not blank, right? So if you come to para 6, the writer says, yet some parapsychologists remain disturbed by the lack of consistency, okay? Between, so you can see between is here, so lack of consistency between individual Gansfeld tests. Defenders of telepathy point out that the demanding impressive evidence from the study ignores one basic fact. It takes large samples to detect small effects. Okay. If, as current results suggest, telepathy produces hit rates only marginally above 25% expected by chance. It's unlikely to be detected by the typical Gansfeld study involve 40 people. The group is just not big enough. So sample group were not big enough. Right, so I think we've had a good look at the questions. 
Um, I've been pointed to you where the answers are, okay? So actually it's a skill. I can tell you where it is, which parts to extract, right? But you need to kind of understand the question. So with that, we come to the end of having a look at test one for academic students from Cambridge Book 8. Thank you.